Hey y'all, sorry for the lack of videos recently, or I suppose for quite a long while now, but I've been very, very busy, and I, I know that sounds like an excuse, and that's because it is, it is a bit of an excuse, but we have been extremely busy on fieldwork for much of the last few months. The reason for that is it's summer down here. We have reverse season, so you have winter, we have summer down here. And summer is the time that most animals are doing their breeding. They might start in spring and then carry on through summer. So we've been out there just constantly, constantly, constantly on field work, trying to get as much information, as much data as we can from these birds. So their breeding season started like July, August, depending on the species, and then they're pretty much finishing like now, or just a bit before now. So we've just been constantly out there in the field, trying to get as much information as we can. Um, and some of that stuff we've been doing, we've been putting GPS trackers on Tuckapoo, which are called gannets in English, which are relatives of penguins, but a lot, a lot more interesting, a lot prettier, a lot more elegant, uh, as well as putting GPS trackers on penguins. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the history of a penguin colony, uh, discovered a huge new penguin colony. We think it's the biggest one in the region. We haven't done a full survey yet, but we think this colony that basically no one was aware of is the biggest one in the region. It's exciting, and we just had that over the last few months. So some of the stuff I'm going to be showing you, we're going to be doing that GPS trackers, how we attach it, how we uh, capture the birds, how we, uh, how we do all that stuff. Uh, looking at the history of the penguin colony, uh, invasive species in mainland islands. So I know mainland islands sounds like a contradiction, usually is, but I'll explain what that means in one of these upcoming videos. And then uh, we're even going to have a guest appearance. So in this video right here, we're just going to be talking about this one location. It's called Piha. It's a town just outside of Auckland. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful surfing town with amazing cliffs and everything, but there's a lot of environmental concerns there. And not everyone is aware of that. People tend to think, oh, it's pretty. It must be in pretty good shape. But it actually has a lot of environmental concerns. So I want you to be thinking in those terms while watching the video. Thinking about how just because something appears fine, it's not always. So think about issues in corpus so that might be an environmental problem, it might be wildlife, it might be soil, water, air, anything like that. Um, what are some concerns you would have in corpus, and what are the easy steps you could take to address it, or even difficult steps? Because there's not always an easy solution. But some of these problems in Piha really do have an easy solution, just no one's aware of the issue. So try to think of those things for corpus. A few come to mind right away for me, but I'd really like you guys to start thinking about it, because maybe it's something that no one's ever thought of before, and you might be the one that brings it to attention. So think about that stuff, and I hope you enjoy this stuff. We've got really exciting things coming up, and I really hope you'll enjoy. So I'm here at the top of the island across from the beautiful town of Piha. It's a popular surfing destination here in New Zealand on the west coast, just outside of Auckland. Beautiful place. Uh, I'm on a volcanic rock that I'm going to explain in a little bit the geology and hydrology of it, uh, and how I'm able to just walk across to an island. But why am I here? What particularly brings me here for my research? It's a beautiful place, I, I love to hike it regardless of having a reason, but there's one very important story here and a very important lesson for you guys here. So as you can see all around, there's plenty of really good penguin habitat, I'm thinking particularly right there, and then where the town is, and then all along that coast there. Perfect penguin habitat, but there's no penguins here. What's the reason for that? Is it just they don't like it for some reason? No, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of good habitats, and there used to be penguins here until 1982. So what happened in 1982? And that's where we get the twist, the dark history of this town. So in 1982, one dog killed the entire penguin colony here. One dog, its owner let it off the leash and ran around on the beach and killed the entire penguin colony. There wasn't good documentation of how many penguins that was, but every one of them was gone. There hasn't been a penguin seen on land here since. And what's the lesson in that for you guys? So the number one threat to wildlife across the world in terms of direct mortality or actually being killed. Uh, the main reason for population declines of wildlife is actually not them being killed directly, it's them not being able to breed, them not being able to find suitable habitat or not enough food to build the energy to breed. So the number one source of direct mortality in the world is cats. Cats are the number one threat to wildlife across the world and dogs aren't far behind. So what we have to do about that is be responsible pet owners. I love dogs, I love cats, to a lesser degree dogs are definitely better, uh, but I do love pets. I love these animals, I love having them, but you have to be a responsible pet owner. You can't have them off the leash. That's how it killed the entire penguin colony, and that's not a one-off thing. That's very common. Just last week in Tasmania, 70 penguins were killed by one dog off a leash, and when they interviewed the owner, what'd the owner say? Probably the same thing I would have said, or you would say if your dog did it. Well, they've never done it before. They're good dogs. They're well-behaved dogs. They've never done it but they're still dogs. They're still essentially wolves. And they sometimes have to follow their instincts and they chase and they hunt. That's what they do. So we have to be responsible. Anytime you're anywhere near potential wildlife, 
you need to have a leash on your dog. So all the citizens of Piha right over there, they need to be having leashes on their dogs. And there are signs everywhere. Dogs aren't even allowed on the beach anymore for that exact reason, for killing wildlife. And then throughout the town, it's illegal to have them off a leash, as it is in many places, and particularly here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, because it's such a threat to the native wildlife to have dogs and cats running around. And the other important thing to do as a pet owner, spay and neuter your pets, please. There are so many unwanted dogs and cats. Uh, if you want another dog or a cat, there are plenty in kennels to go get, but in general, there are just too many. And even if you don't intend to breed your dog or cat and you don't have another one, so you don't expect it to be breeding, cats breed around the neighborhood. That's a very common issue, and particularly there in Corpus. There's a lot of stray cats just from owners that didn't spay or neuter their, their pet, and they went off and had kittens or puppies. And it's really sad for the kittens and puppies as well as for the wildlife they disrupt. So be a responsible pet owner, use leashes, spay and neuter. Those are really important. So all those surfers down there, they're aware that there are sharks there. But shark attacks are pretty uncommon as they are throughout most of the world. Generally, you're not gonna have an issue with the shark unless you have like an open wound or you're doing something that agitates the shark even if it's accidental. But in general, shark attacks are pretty uncommon. So do you know the way to tell if there's a shark in the water? Take a taste of the water and if it's salty, there's a shark nearby. So this plant right here, the one with the yellow flowers, that's called gorse. It's not native to here. It's from Britain. Uh, I believe it's in other places in Europe, but mostly from Britain. And as Aotearoa New Zealand was colonized by Britain, it's reasonable to think that it was brought over here by the British. So how did it get on top of a volcanic island on the west coast of Aotearoa New Zealand? No one wants it. It's a pest even over in Britain. So they wouldn't have purposely planted it. Definitely not up here. There's no reason to plant it up here. How did it get here? Probably on the underside of someone's boot or it just got stowed away on a ship somehow. And that is the main conservation issue facing Aotearoa New Zealand right now. It's unwanted pests like gorse, rats, mice, stoats, uh, ferrets, all the different animals and plants that aren't from here and the native species just aren't prepared to defend themselves from. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been doing it yet at this site, but there are islands that are completely covered in gorse and it's killed all the native population. That's what's called an invasive species. So there are non-native species, which are ones that are from somewhere else, but they aren't harmful. And then you have invasive species, and those are ones like rats, mice, and gorse. They're ones that are dangerous. Usually they reproduce very fast. They outcompete competition, and sometimes they directly kill competition in the case of like rats and mice. So it's very important whenever you're going to an isolated place, like an island or another country, very important to check your clothes, check your boots, check tires, all those different things, to make sure you aren't carrying seeds, uh, to make sure you aren't carrying any unwanted pests, because you might accidentally transmit some of those, some of those different pests and start an invasion of a plant or an insect or maybe even a rodent. So some of the plants up here. This right here is what we call a sedge. It looks like a member of the Carex genus, but I'm not totally sure on that. I'm still not great with New Zealand's plants. And this is a grass. You know how we tell them apart? This has four sides to it, whereas this only has two or three. Uh, grasses will have two or three, and sedges will have four sides. Do you know why that is? So botanists can tell them apart. So I'm about to walk across this right here. And what this is, is a meeting of two different bodies of water. So over there, you can see just a little hole in the rock. And that's where years and years and years and years and tens of thousands of years have eroded away at the rock. And where landslides washed away the rock on that side, right there, it got wedged between these two different bodies of water, or bodies of rock. Like many places in New Zealand, it's volcanic rock. It's very porous, it erodes very easily, and that's how we get just random stacks of rock coming up like this. So that's where the water's coming in from, where I just walked across. Oh. So as you can tell, a slight change of clothing and even of season. I filmed that other stuff a couple months ago and I now have a special guest for you today. Hey guys, what do you think? A nice field trip here to do some biology or maybe even some geometry. You just have to hike up that. Yeah, it's not a very pleasant walk. There's some very violent waves and very steep and vegetation no everywhere. And, and no trail. There's no trail, yeah. So what do you think? Field trip for next year? 